Welcome back here, another Double A Quarantine Podcast, as uh, we are checking back with uh, one of the all-time greats of the Bowie Bay Sox, Johnny Tucker. Uh, my name's Adam Pohl. We got Adrian with us as well. And John, man, it's so good to see you. You are looking great, my man. And tell us how you're doing in this time. I know you got a young family where you're riding this all out and how things are going. Yeah, man, just trying to trying to stay active, quarantine style. Been doing a lot of projects around the house. Um, I'm in the midst of a pergola build that's taken a little bit longer than I would have liked. But <laughs> no, I'm enjoying life, man. I'm in California. My kids are here. Uh, my family is safe. Um, my wife has been brilliant with keeping the kids occupied. Uh, not a whole lot of complaints. That's great. I know that uh, obviously you were a part of such a great Bay Sox team in 2008. But the East League in general was a big, big part of your career. You were a three-year Bay Sox, went on to play some in Harrisburg. And, and it's interesting because you're from California. You played college baseball at Florida, but, but you spent your entire career in affiliated baseball. Well, really, your entire career on the East Coast and here in the Nats uh, or in the Orioles and then the Nats organizations. Yeah, and, and currently I work for the Pittsburgh Pirates, which is based out of Bradenton. So mm -hmm. I, I can't get away from Florida. I can't get away from the East Coast. <laughs> or, or people talk about jumping on a flight to go here. Like my, my flight for since I was 18 years old and going to Florida has been a cross-country flight from San Francisco to, to Jacksonville and then taking, you know, an hour and a half drive from Jacksonville to Gainesville. So that's just, you know, my experience. Um, and – you know, baseball has taken me to a lot of cool places and, and you know, the East Coast and it's, it's just one of them. You know, in the Eastern League, I felt like, you know, I almost graduated from that league. I was there in, you know, oh, eight, nine, ten, And then when I was with the Nationals 11, so I was like a senior and, you know, I almost had an opportunity to come back to the 12th. And I, I didn't I didn't want to be a fifth year senior. So, uh, you know, I stayed in Indy ball. John, it was so great when you um, came back with the Nats. You were always a fan favorite and are still a fan favorite of the Bay Sox. Can you tell us a behind-the-scenes story with one of your roommates or something that's fun? Because we always found you entertaining and you always, you know, always knew you were up to something. So just give us a, a fun old roommate story. Oh, yeah, so it really put me on the spot. Um, I, you know, I, I, had a, I had a bunch of different roommates throughout my time in the Eastern League. You know, Adam Donahue was always one of my favorites because we would always have, you know, late night, you know, pizza runs and stuff like that. And so Donnie would always be snoring. I'm like, well, I'm give Donnie a piece of his own medicine. I just started like I would just be really loud and just eating pizza while he's sitting there eating and spruffling through the, the box at, you know, three in the morning. So it's just little pranks like that. I mean, we, we've done pranks before where we've done the, the, uh, the big bucket, uh, the garbage can with water. You fill it up next to somebody's door and then you knock and then run and they open the door and then eight gallons of water is just pouring on their hotel floor in the middle of nowhere. So that type <laughs> of stuff went on uh, regularly. And, you know, sometimes you have to do that to break up the, the minor league monotony. And I know we don't get to see your kids because you said it would be a little bit of a zoo. But can you tell us a little about your kids and how old they are? And... Yes. So, so since I've since you guys see me last, I'm married with three kids. Uh, my daughter is a so she was a sophomore in high school until she can no longer go to school here in California. Um, and then I have two little boys, um, three and two. Uh, my son will be two this summer. My son just had a quarantine birthday a couple of weeks ago. It's been an amazing, um, completely different discipline. Uh, being a parent, and mm -hmm. I honor all the parents out there, single parents, both parents, whatever. If you're doing your, you're raising your kids, hats off to you. Johnny, tell us what you're doing with the Pirates right now. Uh, so this will be my second year with the Pirates. Uh, as a, I'm currently uh, working in the hitting space as a hitting coach. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, love my time. A couple uh, former Orioles, Randor Bierge in the organization. Uh, Gerardo Alvarez is also the organization. Um, and obviously just playing against dudes over the years, there's, there's familiar faces in the room. So, uh, you know, enjoy, enjoying the Pirates so far, man. You know, it's interesting because here in 2020, we, uh, this season in Reading, the Phillies affiliate, uh, in the Eastern league, their hitting coach, uh, was going to be Tyler Hansen and then their pitching coach, uh, Brad Bergeson and Brad Bergeson. We'll talk a little bit about that 2018 you were a part we I was the broadcaster Adrian with uh, Johnny and Frederick in 2007 for the most unlikely championship team in which the keys were 10 games below 500 for the season and won the, the Carolina League title and then that was the really the 
the group that went to Bowie together and you were able to throw together guys like Chris Tillman, and Matt Wieters, and Nolan Reimold and add that to the core of the 07 Keys, which were guys like Corey Spoon and Brad Bergeson and Brandon Irby and, and all of those guys, David Hernandez, Jason Birkin. And, uh, you, you guys had great pitching. And uh, tell us about that 08 season, because, Johnny, it's still the tied for the best regular season in Bay Sox history. I don't doubt it, man. I, that, that year stuck out. I remember, you know, there was a stint where we rambled off like a 15-game win streak. I mean, we were just unconscious. Every, whether or not you were coming off the bench, whether or not you were a regular starter. I mean, everybody just – and it, it was one of those teams, too, that it, it, it wasn't all performance. It was, it was a, there was a gelling effect that was happening in the clubhouse. There, were, there, was, there was a closeness there that was different. And even though there was – we had some veterans who had had some double-A time, even major league time, they were on our team. Uh, like Julio Mignon had – you know, I think – I don't remember how old he was at the time, but mm-hmm. he, seemed like he, he seemed like he was the grandpa. I was 24 years old. I was 25 years old. He seemed like he was <laughs> 40. And he was probably – if I look at the numbers, he was probably 28 or something, you know. Um, but you just, we just had that unique group, man. We had Jeff Nettles, who was coming out of Indy Ball. He had his, you know, salt on his shoulder from his career already. We had, you know, Luis Martinez, who was an outcast from the Cubs, who ended up winning the Triple Crown. And it was just, it was just this unlikely group of, of dudes that had, a, had some likeness, and we just did some special things. And, you know, there was never any, you know, arguments. There was never any issues. It was all just healthy competition. And, um going back to what you said in 2007 about that team we that was that was a group that was drafted together grew up together in in the minor league organization we didn't really know how special we were probably 90 percent of that team ended up playing in the big leagues um and it was just fun to be a part of man and it was it was it was a special time a lot in, in my life i was 24 25 years old not a whole lot of responsibilities um and it was just you know baseball 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 so uh really special years that that 2008 was you know I, I have lifelong relationships from there you know nettles and i jeff nettles and i for for instance i ended up playing mm-hmm. in somerset because of him and i remember he came from somerset and was speaking so highly of any ball and i'm like oh, i'm not doing any ball and then so happened that we wound up on the field together in any ball and i loved it played four years there so um a lot of roads open up from from this game you know undoubtedly Making the transition to being a coach now, who are some of the coaches you looked to, up to growing up and are following some of their lead? I mean, I think it would be naive to say that, that I don't take a little piece of, from every coach that I've come across. Now, that there's going to be coaches that are going to have larger influences than others, uh, but sometimes you have coaches that teach you what not to do, and I think those lessons are just as valuable as the ones to do uh, because they, they can cross off those things off the list or you know – I don't want to approach that situation where this coach may have. Uh, now, I, I've had more quality coaches than, than negative, uh, definitely. Um, you know, my high school coach, Matt Costello, was one that sticks out to me. You know, Brad Kamensky, mm-hmm. the one that I had in Bowie. Mm-hmm. The personality of Tommy Thompson. You know, all of these, these coaches had a uh, profound impact on me as a person, as a man, and, and just in, in my baseball career and, and how I'm going to, to educate and help, help these players. I, ultimately. I still feel like I'm in a, a, a position of service. I'm, I'm helping people. Not everybody is going to make it to the big league. So I, I really look at how I'm impacting these men um, on a day-to-day basis and how they're going to, to, to carry themselves throughout their lives. You know, Adrian, I think about uh, Brad comments and Tommy Thompson. And you think about baseball in general, it's such a different game, you know, than football where you're gearing towards this big battle every week in such baseball as an everyday game, it can really wear on players. If you're in the minor leagues, you know, the goal is not necessarily winning every game. I mean, you want to, but it's about getting better, improving, and gets, getting to your ultimate goal. And there's so much stress that goes into that. And I think that uh, guys like Tommy, and Brad, they were so good at keeping it loose and making it a fun environment. And sometimes when you're having a great time, that can lead to, to the most growth. And the environment is everything. Um... I, I think we can we can look at you, you know what type of house you know what, what type of household you keep what's happening in the world environment is everything and, and people mm-hmm. and players respond to the environment that you put out there um what, when you walk in the door and you have a certain type of energy people are going to feed off of that people are going to going to see that 
So, I mean, from the, the, the very first day I met Tommy, Tommy's doing ridiculous <laughs> stuff, making us do inappropriate stretches, putting different <laughs> names on the back of guys' jerseys putting fake letters of the tobacco police. He's calling team meetings about the tobacco police saying the guy's got fined $2,000. He made up, he made it up. And like, and we're like trying to compete and hit 300 and get to the big leagues. And this guy is like, but you know, we laugh about it today. Like I speak with Kennard Jones, former teammate, and we literally come to tears, you know, saying some of these stories. A, a former teammate of ours passed away this off season, uh, Brian Bach. And I hadn't mm -hmm. talked to Travis Brown in, you know, a couple of years. He and I were really close as players. And he called me, you know, because he and Brian were very close. And we just started reminiscing these stories. And we both just, you know, just had this warmth of feeling taken over us. And, and you know, having those conversations and, and, and these people who have impacted you and these experiences that, you know, happened. It's just, you know, it's, it was a breath of fresh air, you know. Well, Johnny, we've been doing a real fun uh, game. So we're going to okay. do a Would You Rather, and uh, Adam's going to give a 30-second clock for us. Okay. All right, here we go. That's right, that's right. All right. All right here we go. Vanilla or chocolate ice cream? Chocolate ice cream. Halloween or Christmas? Christmas. Rap or country? <laughs> Rap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, country is like his favorite and rap backs it up. <laughs> Depends on what type of mood I am, right? If I'm, if I'm on the boat, okay, maybe. <laughs> uh, pie or cake? Cake. Uh, a rainy day or a little bit cloudy? Rainy day. Would you, which uh, worst subject in school would you say math? Math. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent short version of Would You Rather. And, uh, <laughs> sorry about the music question. That was an obvious one. I don't. Uh, I went to Tennessee, so I had the country for like four years, and then I was like, "That's it. I can't do it anymore." So um, there, there was there's a song. I mean, there's a couple of songs that I like. There was a uh, Tennessee whiskey. That that was a I was a record. Oh, yeah, yeah. I probably on everybody's right. Yeah, that's on everybody's. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I love it. Thank you so much, Johnny. It's so good to see you. So good to have you with us here. And we, we really appreciate it. Wish you all the best of luck. Thank you so much. I just want to let everybody know to this day, when I hear the national anthem, I still say O's. Still trying to get it out of me. Thanks for having me, guys. Good seeing everybody. Thank you.